Recording. And we are sharing the screen. And now here we are. Okay. Let's see if by the end of the clip, Windows is still stuck. Maybe it won't come back ever again. Who knows? Okay. So um, you multiply polynomials and their degrees had uh, as long as your ring is a domain and uh, I guess if, if R is not a domain if you go through the proof um, what we need is that the, the leading terms are not zero divisors because the proof consisted of look at the leading term of f times g and make sure it's not zero. And remember that a zero divisor is an, an element of a ring that can that can multiply, uh, that it always is a divisor of zero. You can multiply by something non-zero and, and get zero. <clears throat> okay, so. Uh, there's a lot of consequences of this fact. Um, consequence one is that if R is a domain, um, the polynomial ring over it is also a domain. Because, uh, well, because we said the degree of the degree of the zero polynomial was negative infinity. And the, and, and this, uh, this statement works as well if the degree is, if I say the degree is negative infinity. Um, what, you know, oh, I said, well, when you, when you multiply polynomials with degrees add, you add negative infinity to anything, you, we say we get negative infinity. Um, so if the if the left hand side so the proof is very short. Um, if that times g is zero, this means that the degree of that times g is negative infinity. And using the, the statement before, that means that the degree of f plus the degree of g is negative infinity. Um, and how can two things add to negative infinity um, if they're either positive numbers or negative infinity? Well, one of them has to be negative infinity. And if your degree is negative in infinity, that means that you're zero. So if you look at the beginning and the end, if a product of two things is zero, that means one of them is zero. That is exactly saying that the ring we're working on is a domain. Uh, so that's one corollary. Um, second corollary. If R is a domain, I can tell you what the what the units um, the units of the polynomial ring are. Uh, the units, remember, of a ring. Uh, this is the name we give to the elements that are invertible by multiplication. Elements that have a multiplicative inverse.
and, and the yeast former group, as you know, with multiplication, because um, we know that they're associated with multiplication, uh, we, um, with, if, a ring, if the ring has a unit, then they have an identity element. And what we need is an inverse, and if we, if we just look at things that have an inverse, then that's all the group accent right there. The units are just the units of R, um, which of course um, are, are seen as polynomials of degree zero. So let's prove this real fast. So, um, what is the easy containment here from left to right or from left, right to left? The what, sorry? Which one? So, there's two inclusions here. Uh, which one is easy? One of them is easier than the other. So to say that the um, units in R are going to also be units in uh, the polynomial based on R. Yes, that's the that's <laughs> one. Yeah. Uh, so let's start with that one. So uh, all we need to prove is that a unit in R is invertible in is invertible in the as a polynomial. So, what does this mean? Um, if I think of it as a polynomial, which of course I'm just being silly here because you would never ever write zero x. Um, uh, what is the inverse in the polynomial ring? It's just the same inverse. <clears throat> so, so that's one inclusion. I assume that someone who left when I was uh, in the middle of technical mystery and honestly, I don't blame you for it. Or maybe you were having worse technical problems than I was, in which case I am very sorry. Um, so the other inclusion, uh, the other inclusion is, is more interesting because we have to use what we actually learned. Um, so let's say we have a polynomial. Uh, and say the last term is not zero. Um, and we're assuming that f is not zero because if f is not zero, I already know that that's not a unit. Um, so then f times its inverse is one. So, um, so now we have to actually do something. I mean, it's one thing that we have to do, but I think for the other step, we did zero thing. So this is harder. The degree on both sides is the same. So the degree of F times F inverse equals the degree of the polynomial one, which is zero. So um, now using the proposition from uh, Wednesday on the previous page, when you multiply polynomials, uh, the degrees hat, which is why I was saying that R has to be a domain here. It's always, you always need to ask yourself where you're using your hypothesis, um, because you know if you don't use your hypothesis, either your statements 
wasn't great or your proof was wrong. Um, so um, when you multiply polynomials, the degrees add. So how can the degrees of two polynomials add to zero? Uh, they have to both be zero because degrees are not negative. So f was actually just a naught. It was just a constant term. And f inverse is just b naught. And the fact that uh, f times f inverse is 1 means um, that a naught b naught is 1. So a naught is a unit in R. <laughs> and that's it. So that's uh, those implications. So so that's the units of that's the units of the polynomial ring uh, for a domain. If if you're not in a domain, it's actually a lot more things can happen. Um, you could actually have um, you you could have uh, polynomials that don't look like that are not constant polynomials uh, being vertible. Um, there's, there's a lot of, there's an example of that in your homework uh, for next week. Okay, um, so any questions? Okay. Right. Um, so, um, so far I've been talking about polynomials in one variable. So very quickly, let me tell you what, um, let me tell you what polynomials in, in several variables are. Because, um, turns out we, I don't need to do extra work. Um, so, to define the ring of polynomials in two variables. What we do is we just um, take polynomials in, in one variable. And now our join x is, uh, our join x is a ring, our regex x. Um, and I said, I've defined what polynomials are with coefficients in any ring. So polynomials, so what we do is we take polynomials with coefficients in polynomials in X. And, and that's it, that are, those are polynomials in, in two variables. So, um, and of course, if you wanted to do polynomials in 13 variables, um, that's this is all you need to do. Uh, so one thing, so there's one. Only one problem here um, that I'm not going to solve. I mean, it's, it's straightforward, but tedious. Um, really, X and Y should be interchangeable. Um, Meaning, I'm saying polynomials in X and Y are polynomials in Y with coefficients in R brackets X, uh, but they should also be polynomials in X with coefficients in polynomials in Y. So doing one and, and then the other, th these two operations should commute. And of course, um, these are not equal because um, really polynomials in X are sequences. I mean, they might be equal, but I don't want them to be, I don't want them to be equal that way um, because they're, well, they're, they're not exactly, they're, I just identify them the same way. They're not exactly the same thing. However, they should be indistinguishable and indistinguishable uh, for two rings, as you know, 
means that they should be isomorphic. Oh, oh no, I thought my computer managed to start, but it just has to be one blank. <laughs> um, so really what I need to verify that there is a unique isomorphism sending x to x and y to y. Um, this is this is really what I want. Um, that would tell me that would tell me give me peace of mind that this operation really is commutative. Um, Otherwise, I would have to, I don't have to be worried here. Um, okay. So, um, really, anything anything you prove about polynomials with coefficients in a ring uh, is just true for polynomials with coefficients um, with polynomials in in any number of variables. For this reason, because a polynomial in three variables is, is just a polynomial in one variable with coefficients in, in another in another ring. So this isomorphism, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna write it down, but basically what I'm saying is um, here on the left polynomials look like this. They are polynomials in, in Y with coefficients in your polynomials in X, and what you should, um, what you're supposed to do, is rewrite the polynomial as a polynomial in in X with coefficients in Y. So you're supposed to take all the uh, well, just redistribute uh, terms with equal X degree, and that's all there is to it. and show that this is an isomorphism. So you should preserve the, you should um, make sure that you believe that the sum is defined in the same way in both sides, as well as the multiplication, and that this operation that I just did has an inverse. All right. <clears throat> um, any questions? Move on. Um, so moving on to the next section in the book. Um, uh, polynomial division. So, I mean, you've seen this in your life. And if you've taken class two, you've seen, you've had to do polynomial long division. Um, so you know you know what it is, and it, the thing is, um, it works the same as with integers. So, um, so this is underlying. Just um, just a, a very important idea that if if k is a field, polynomials in one variable over a field. And the integers are very similar. Um, and well, I'll get more into detail in, into how they are similar. But I think at the heart of it all is the fact that you can do long division, which um, well, it's not it's not definitely not a given. So uh, what do I mean by saying you can do division? What do we say? What makes long division long? I feel like I don't know this because I didn't take elementary school math in English. So what I'm trying to say is um, let K be a field. 
and lead and take two polynomials. In, in over over the field. Uh, then there exists uh, there exists a, a unique pair of polynomials. The quotients and the remainder with two conditions. Um, first that P is Q times C. Uh, that's one condition, and the other is that the degree of the remainder is smaller than the degree of the um, say denominator. You didn't. <clears throat> so um, P is uh, Q times the quotient plus the remainder. And there's a lot of polynomials with these conditions. For example, make, make C equals zero and find an R. Basically, make C anything you want and solve for R, and that will give you a pair of polynomials. But what I'm saying is there's only uh, there's only one uh, there's only one if I impose the condition these two conditions um, these three conditions. Q and R, uh, Q. Well, Q is money. Um, so, um, how is this like uh, the division we're used to? So let me just write the same statement for the integers. Um, take two integers. Um, there exists unique CNR. So exists with an exclamation mark means exists and is unique. Um, such that uh, few things happen. Uh, P is Q times C plus R. Um, the absolute value of R is smaller than the absolute value of Q. And lastly, um, Are we positive? <clears throat> so, um, so these are, I mean, these are the exact same formula, right? Um, and then both integers and polynomials have in common that you can measure how uh, big something is in, in a sense. You can measure how big an integer is because they have an absolute value which is a real number and polynomials have degrees and you could say bigger degree means um means you're bigger uh and lastly if you try to do division with integers um i guess the, the remainder um the remainder could be a negative number and still be smaller in absolute value than the than the dividend but you can solve this if you just ask for the remainder to be positive here, uh, you can see that if you multiply Q by a constant, you will get a similar formula. You know, wait, which one I multiply by a constant? Uh, sorry, I'm multiplying. Oh no, what am I, what am I saying? I blame, I blame my computer that has my notes. I can multiply a point of a constant, but it's just, um, this gives you an answer. Okay. Um, 
So, so that's what we got to prove. Um, so, I mean, you know how to do this. Um, you might have not seen a proof. Um, <clears throat> So um, we have P and Q, the polynomial ring, and we want P and R such that um, uh, P is P times Q plus R. And the degree of R is smaller than the degree of Q. <laughs> and I guess Q can't be zero. You can't divide by zero. So, um, so what we do is um, is uh, do induction on the degree of P. So um, I guess P could be zero, um, which is kind of silly. You just take the, the quotient, is it gonna be equal to zero and the remainder is gonna be equal to zero and we're done. So just ignore this because it's not interesting at all. So, um, so the base case is gonna be when the degree of P is smaller than the degree of Q. Um, so what do we do? So what is the um, what is the answer if the degree of P is smaller than the degree of Q? If you're trying to divide something by something of larger degree. So, um, an example, take P equals X plus one, and Q equals X squared minus three. So we're trying to solve this equation um, with uh, the real R smaller than the uh, two in this case. So what do I make C and R in this case? Right, let's do an example with the integers. Uh, what is the division with remainder? Um, of uh, three divided by seven, so you're supposed to do three equals portion times seven plus the remainder. C is zero and R is three. C is zero. Right, so if you're trying, basically if you're starting with something smaller than the, um, than the dividend, um, you're, you're just, you already have the remainder. So does this work for polynomials? In this case, can we make C equals zero?
uh, what do I make? Well, if I make c equals zero, this is gonna make this equation just x plus one equals r. Um, so is this a solution? Uh, I think so, because the degree of r is smaller than two, it's just one. So in general, uh, if the degree of p is smaller than the degree of q, just make the quotient equal to zero and the remainder equal to uh, p. And then you will have that p equals zero times q plus r, indeed. Um, and the degree of r will equal the degree of p, which is, um, by hypothesis, smaller than the degree of q. So we're done. Okay. Any questions? Must you just have to take out two? So I feel like where this is familiar from is from part two when you have to integrate rational functions. And you always see integrals like this one. And you kind of, since this is kind of the only integral you see in Gog 2, all the, in practice all the time, you forget about the first step. And then, um, then in the exam, they give you this integral. And you forget that you're supposed to do long division. You write it like this. Um, I don't know if this is ringing a bell from your childhood, maybe. Um, okay, so let's prove the induction step. So now we have F, B, and Q, and we want, we want uh, this. Okay. Um, so, you, I mean, you can think of what you would do, um, what you would do uh, just if you were doing long division and I want to get rid of the leading term of P. So say that P is, um, some polynomial and Q is A not B, B not EM X to the M. So, um, so if I want to, if I want to write a C. I'm just going to make my life very easy. I want to write a C such that I won't get the whole identity, but at least I will get rid of um, I will get rid of the leading term. So how can I get rid of the leading term? Um, we'll say I want um, I don't want it. I don't want it to be um, degree uh, smaller than p yet. But well, no, not p q. Um, so when I subtract from p, it's a multiple of q that makes the degree go just one one less, or you know that that. that that's all I need because uh, that would be enough for the induction. Um, so, for example, 
for example. I want to divide x to the fourth plus one by x cubed plus one. Um, I don't know what the full quotient. I know what the full quotient is. Maybe x squared. I don't know what to write here to make the degree of this whole result be as small as it can be. But I know what to write to make it um, just one degree less, or maybe two degrees less, which is write x squared. Um, x squared is just x to the fourth divided by x squared. And that will ensure that this um, has no x to the fourth term. Um, this is this is how you do long division, right? So um, in this case, what I want to do is um, let's see be the quotient of a n x to the n divided by b n x to the n, which is going to be a n divided by b n. Of course, I'm assuming there is not these are not zero. Um, otherwise, I should just write it with smaller, um, smaller degree. And I'm assuming so. N is the degree of p. M is the degree of q. And I'm assuming that the degree of p is at least the degree of q. Otherwise, I'm in the previous uh, case. <clears throat> so. If I do this, p minus q c, let's call this c1. Um, as degree smaller than n. Um, so why, why is that? Well, because I can just Write it out. So this is a n x to the n plus lower order terms. This is b n x to the n plus lower order terms. And this is just a n divided by b n times x to the n minus m. Well, so Multiplying this out, it just cooks the the c so that this will cancel. Um, this is going to be a n x to the n plus lower order terms. Degree less than n. Um, okay. Any questions? This, 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 this makes sense. This is like the first real proof we do in this class. Basic. Your microphone is on. I don't know if that's on purpose. Uh, I'm going to finish my mic. Okay, so, um, so where are we? Um, given PQ with degree of P bigger or equal than the degree of Q. Um, I found C1. That uh, e, if I call this uh, P one, as uh, degree less than n. 
So this is what we just did. And now, um, I mean, we're, we're almost done. So I have to finish next week. Um, we finish. Um, we will just um, let, uh, let the induction hypothesis. Since uh, P1 has smaller degree, we can divide it by Q and we will get P2 times Q plus some remainder. And with these two things together, uh, we'll be done. All right. Uh, okay, so that's all for today. Uh, feel free to stick around and ask any questions you might have. Um, but otherwise, uh, Monday is Martin Luther King Day, so I'm going to see.